would actually call it a cadence of execution where first off is my mental and physical preparation. So that's getting ready before the event. So we would have a briefing. I would be visualizing. I use mental as well as physical assets. Hopefully I'm eating well. I'm doing all the things I can do to be uh, in the right state to give me the best chance for that day. Then I brief it and I visualize it. Um, and and I, when I visualize, it's not just thinking about it. I, I'm feeling it. I, I I know exactly what it looks like. What are the letters on the airplane that I'm next to? Um, so I'm, I'm living it, right? I'm breathing it. And it's one thing to visualize yourself. It's really cool in the Blue Angels when we do a group visualization. That That's unbelievable when you have that power in a group, right? Then you execute the event and you do it. But the most important part is what I would call the debrief, okay? Now, the concept of the debrief is not new, but in the Blue Angels, we took it to a whole new level. And that's where the learnings come in. So we put more emphasis on the post-event than we did the pre-event. And if you think about everybody here who's listening, I guarantee you, look at the amount of effort that you put into before a race. Look at all the preparation, look at all the effort, and yet how much effort do you put in after the race? to do two things. One is celebrate what the hell you just did because you better celebrate your victories so you want to get out there and do it again. But more importantly, learn from it. Where were the gaps? Where can I improve my own performance? Where can we as a team improve? Where can I improve um, the elements of not just the execution, but what happened prior to? That's the secret sauce. The secret sauce of the Blue Angels is the way we debrief and the way we keep gratitude as the ethos of what we're doing. Welcome to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are Jess and BJ, and we're on a mission to create a better world. It's the world we all dream to see. It's the one where we are truly free. And the one and only way to create this world is to make the changes from within. That's it. There's no other way. We must change in order to see the change. The recipe is simple. The techniques are plain. But the subject matter runs deep, and we're going there today. We are super pumped to have with us John Foley, call sign Gucci. John is a former lead solo pilot of the Blue Angels, a Sloan Fellow at the Stanford School of Business, a top rated keynote speaker to over 1,500 organizations worldwide, best selling author, and perhaps our favorite title for this guy, Gratitude Guru. As a Blue Angel pilot, John represented one tenth of one tenth of one percent of all the pilots in the world, flying at speeds of more than 500 miles per hour and in formation as close as 18 inches apart. John is no stranger to excellence, focus, and precision that rides the absolute razor's edge of life and death. He has learned to make his mind one-pointed. He has learned to trust, and he has learned that being grateful is the basis of living in the high-performance zone. And so without another moment passing, we are tremendously thankful for this conversation that is about to go down. John, welcome to the show. Jess and BJ, I'm glad to be here, and you're <laughs> going to see uh, that has a deep meaning in my life. So thank you for having me. Yeah, we cannot wait to to dive in. So how I found you was you did a keynote for my brother's company, UKG, which I think back oh, yeah. the first time. Yeah, Kronos. So Rob Kennedy is his boss. Um, yeah, yeah. My brother, uh, his name is Matt, and he is in the S&G vertical, the, I think the services, I can't remember what it's called. Yes. It's, it's all too high tech for me. But I think you were there recently. I but was. It was a couple years ago. And my brother's, he's amazing. He's on the path. He's, he, he trains with my husband and he meditates and all that good stuff. And he's such a high performer. And he started sending me your videos. I mean, it took about 10 seconds for me to say, we got to get this guy on the show. Um, and we always trust timing and timing is so divine. And so here we are really probably a couple years later, here we are to throw down this convo. So thank you so much for your time. We know you're a super busy dude and we're really grateful. That's, I love the connection. And I'm kind of curious, which of the videos grabbed you? What was it that said, oh man, we got to have this guy on our podcast? It was about gratitude and gratitude okay. just being the basis of everything that we have control really about how we're going to experience life. And we can experience life through the energy of, you know, negativity and lack, mm -hmm. which I think is epidemic in our world. 
or we can choose because we have free will, we can choose to be thankful. And so something we always say around here is like, there's always something to be grateful for. And um, for us, it's a guiding light. And for us, it really is like you, it's the platform for, it's the Mm -hmm. jumping off point, I think, for excellence and greatness in our life. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm wearing this shirt. Those, I know we're audio, but glad to be here is the the brand, the message, the ethos that not only I live my life by, but we on the Blue Angels have a saying. And that that glad to be here is really, I think, the essence of what you're talking about. It's not just gratitude. It is gratitude. Huge. Um, grateful for the experiences. Sometimes you're just grateful to be alive, right? I mean, I've had those days, right? But it's mostly about uh, appreciation for the team you're with, the opportunity that's there, and it also involves excellence. So to me, that's that's what a glad to be here mindset is all about. Mm. It's powerful, and you exude it. Like I can just feel mm. that energy, and this is why people are, you know, being inspired to make change in their life because you're living it. You know, you're walking the talk, and that is everything. Yeah, we all have to do that, right? I mean, like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, right? So whatever it is that's internal to us, um, yeah, you've got to you got to be authentic, humble, and just live it. And, and by the way, it's fun. I mean, that's the cool part. You don't have to fake it. <laughs> yeah, not when it's authentic, not when it comes from the heart. Like if you've connected yeah. with that and it feels it feels good, then why wouldn't you just feel good all the time? That's yeah. uh, something we come up with a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all have choices. We have the choices. And I started watching your videos uh, back, back because I, I love that you right away are like, well, which video, what was it about it that pulled it out? And this is where inspiration meets action. This is where we start to take like, well, what is it about the essence of it and how have you applied it? So yeah. I think uh, the videos that you were doing, I think about two years ago when you started doing these little clips during COVID, um, mm-hmm. it, helping people, I would, I would, is, is part of your mantra to help people kind of see like what's happening and, and that they do have a choice in their daily, mm, their daily life that can begin to turn things around, begin to not go down the hole of, you know, why me, why this? And instead, what is it about, what is it about that I can control that can sort of turn things around, shift things to another perspective. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I heard a definition once of inspired. I, I'm glad you, you get, you're you talking about how do you go from inspiration to activation um, is to inspire is to breathe life into. I, when I heard that, I went, oh, that's a cool, that's a cool definition to breathe life into what? Somebody else, something else. And that, that includes action. You know, we, we got to take action. Um, so one of the things I like to do every morning is I do, uh, you know, I have a morning routine and uh, I wake up uh, happy. I've trained my brain to wake up happy. Uh, that's a technique, by the way. All of us can do this. And it starts with a, a gratitude practice. It has movement. Um, but yeah, you know, how we start our day, I think also matters into what happens. And I like what you said, Jess, I heard you say this, is uh, I believe the world's coming from us, not at us. And that's an interesting, deep thought. If, uh, if you truly grasp that, then you're absolutely right. Uh, we can create our own destiny and it can be fun. Mm-hmm. I think that it, get, it got lost somewhere that it's a birthright for us to experience joy in this life and, and not as a fleeting emotion, but as a state of being. Yes. Love that idea. A joyful effort, I like to say. Uh, ev- everything I'm, I'm about. Yeah. So I have a question which is a little off Blue Angels, but definitely not off topic. Every morning, BJ and I have these, uh, you know, we're yogis, so we have these medicine cards and we pull them and they're animal cards. And so I pulled the dog today, oh. which, is, which is loyalty. And maybe or maybe not, a little birdie came on my shoulder and encouraged me to ask you about Ruby and Nash yeah. and the impact that they have or have had on your life. Because I think dogs are so mm-hmm. powerful if we, yeah. if we listen to their teachings and we live those. Well, it's so funny you you mentioned that, right? Sitting at my feet is Nash right now. He's all stretched out. So uh, Ruby and Nash are Rhodesian Ridgebacks for everybody who who doesn't uh, uh, can only hear. Uh, we actually rescued uh, Ruby 
about a year ago, and she's three years old now. Uh, and uh, we rescued her in Minneapolis from the Ridgeback Rescue of the USA. And I remember flying out there and putting her in a car and driving back and uh, just an incredible joy. Uh, 70 pounds, awesome. And really it was my wife, who uh, Carol, who said, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's go up and rescue some dogs. And then just recently, uh, Ruby was telling us, you know, I love the idea of loyalty, right? She was giving us clues that, hey, I'd, I'd like to have a playmate. I would like to have somebody. Um, so we put it out to the universe kind of a little bit, just, you know, see how that goes. And, and bingo, uh, we right now are fostering uh, Nash, who's 106 pounds, male. Okay, he's huge, uh, but very gentle. And it's really cool that you mentioned the word loyalty because, like I said, he's right at my feet. Um, the two of them get along. They sleep together in the same dog bed. They um, they play really rough. I mean, they they're strong dogs and they like to play rough, but they're very they're very kind. So it, it it's it's the essence, right? I, they get me out to walk. We just got back from a walk out my backyard. There, we, we live in Sun Valley, Idaho. You're you're in what California, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Southern uh, Carlsbad, so North County, San Diego. Oh, love Carlsbad. Yeah, in fact, I just spoke there last week. But um, <laughs> yeah, beautiful area. I used to live in Dana Point. I lived on a sailboat in Dana Point in my past. Right up the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the doggies are, are really special. It's interesting you mentioned the word loyalty. Uh, I think that's a big, um, for me, uh, in in really my careers, uh, loyalty matters and uh, and and character matters. Hmm. Let's jump into your story a bit. Uh, yeah. Take us back uh, of where where it all started. When were you first introduced to the Blue Angels? And yeah. then what was that path to get to where you were? I mean, I'm going to say it again, one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent. I like that makes me drool. Like that is that is absolutely where I want to live. So tell us the story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it started uh, with my parents. Uh, my dad was an army officer and an engineer, and I loved my dad. I was born in Germany. I wanted to grow up just like him. So I'm thinking, oh, that's what I'll be. And then my mom had this just beautiful uh, love and compassion. So I really, you know, was brought up in a nice family. I know not not everybody has those beautiful starts, but I did. And uh, one day, my dad took me to an air. Show. I'll never forget this day. 12 years old. I'm a little kid. I uh, It's Newport, Rhode Island, which I understand you all mm-hmm. know Newport, Rhode Island. I was in Newport. He was going to the Naval War College. Uh, and I look up in the sky and I see these six magnificent blue jets that day. And I got to tell you, anyone who's been in air show, you know, San Diego, Carlsbad, we fly out of Miramar, uh, used to fly out of El Toro. So anyone who's been in air show realizes it's visceral right? You're not just looking at these jets. There's smoke oil in the air. You can feel it, the energy. It's like being at a, at a you know, 500,000 people sometimes there at, at Miramar and El Toro, and you can feel the energy. And I remember feeling that. And I just turned to my dad that day and said, dad, I'm going to do that. And, you know, that's a 12-year-old kid. I had no idea how to get there, right? Uh, and that's where I think is a critical element is that I believe dreams hit us in our heart, not the head. Too many times we're up here, right? And we're just we're just staying in our head. And, and that was a moment that it was like, no, man, you know, I can do this. Now, do I know how to do it? No idea. You know, what's the path going to be like? Not sure. Uh, but I just, and it took me 18 years, you know, 18 years from that little boy to, um, to actually strapping in the cockpit as a, as a blue angel. Uh, and, you know, happy to go through that, that path. Uh, it had a lot of, obstacles, a lot of rejection, you know, it didn't happen right away, but, uh, very, the, the quick story is you, you need to become a military pilot. I figured that out pretty quickly. Um, except that I applied for the air force Academy in, instead of the Naval Academy. It turns out blue angels are actually Navy. I'd applied to the wrong team. Um, I got rejected, you know, three times. They said I was not physically qualified just to even get into the academies. Eventually got a medical waiver. Um, didn't graduate number one in my class. Okay. Academically, I graduated in a half to allow the other half to be called the top. All right. So, um, but then finally got my slot, a, a pilot slot. And that's what you kind of, you know, we all know in life, right? There, there's a red line, right? You're either above or below it. And that, that line does shift. So I just wanted, I wanted a shot. I got it. And then, you know, it's time to up your game at that point. You know, being average isn't going to work anymore. Um, and you, you know, Navy pilots, those of you, by the way, uh, probably Top Gun just saw a Top Gun Maverick came out. Most of us, um, I did some of the real flying in the first movie. 
the, the first Top Gun movie. So it was something I wanted to do. And that's what you have to do. You got to fly jets off aircraft carriers. That's an intense experience. You know, triathlon is an intense experience. Well, let me tell you, landing a 22-ton jet on the uh, back end of a boat that's moving around, it's pitching, it's dark, and you're low on fuel, the weather's bad. I mean, you talk about mental focus. That's that's what taught me mental focus. And uh, uh, bottom line is you then become an instructor pilot like in the movie Top Gun. And then uh, that's where the Blue Angels come from. We get our our pilots from the instructor ranks. So in those 18 years that you took to get there, and I know you probably get this question, but like, how, how does the, how does the, how does the drive and passion still be, continue to rise to the surface and not get too carried away with an experience that maybe beat you down or you failed and, um, and then repetitively fail? Cause it sounds like you had a few of them. So oh, yeah. how, how do you keep coming back? Well, I think it's it's all of us finding your passion, right? So for me, flying, I had never flown before. I, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't come from a family that had an airplane or anything like that. So I needed someone to help pay for it, which happened to be the government, right? And uh, and and then when I was flying, uh, that's it's just it's amazing the endorphins you get. You know, I'm thinking I like to work out too, and all all of us do uh, intensely, and and so uh, that's what keeps you coming back, right? Plus the camaraderie and the team function. You know, flying's not an individual sport. I mean, yes, I flew single seat cockpit airplanes, um, just like you know the F-18, just like you saw in the movie. Uh, but it's a team sport, and you're supporting each other, and so the chemistry, the camaraderie, the ability to um, um, excel, the ability to push yourself every day to the limit. And let me tell you, when you're flying on the Blue Angels or you're flying off the carriers, there's a, some pretty hard, you know, there's pretty hard limits and they push back, right? And so when, you, when you're pushing that limit, you can feel it. And, uh, you know, they talk about feeling the seat of your pants when you're flying that jet, like in the movie Top Gun, you saw the, the low altitude flying. That was an ex-Blue Angel solo pilot and a walleye is his name because you can feel the ground effect pushing back. Not everybody can can fly that low. And 50 feet's no big deal. You're going, you know, 600 miles per hour. But 40 feet, yeah, you know, at 30 feet, every ounce of energy is telling you no, right? Because just, just to take that stick and even a millimeter forward takes all your mental concentration because you can only tie the record for a low pass and that danger is out there, right? And so you have to be able to be smart and overcome that kind of uh, fear, really. You know, you just need to overcome fear. Yeah, well, it's something you haven't, you're not, you don't have experience with, right? And that's what fear, it's, just, it's the unknown. It's like, but how do you get to know, how do you, how do you get the known to be the unknown is you got to keep experiencing yeah. it just so happens you're doing it in a very expensive, very big, very powerful uh uh, a plane, but I think I think the more experiences you have like that, the more the known becomes, and then you build the confidence, and then you build um, build your career. Yeah. yeah, and it's incremental improvement, right? Just small things. I mean, you're not jumping into that F-18 at 100 feet. You know, you're starting with a little prop plane, and you're flying at high altitude, and you just you keep working on it. And I like to make a distinction between being scared and afraid. And to me, I'm scared all the time. I, I like being scared. Scares those little hairs that stand up on the back of your neck. You know, scare says, hey, I am pushing the limits, but I'm aware. See, I'm in the present moment. I'm aware. Uh, and because uh, it's easy to kill yourself in this game. That's not hard. What's hard is to be on that edge. And, uh, and so it's this constant evaluation call it nibble in the envelope. You push it and you feel it and you back off. You push it and you back off. You push it and you back off. And uh, it becomes fun. It's like a drug, right? That's racing right there. And I want to address that because we, because the majority of our, of our audience are endurance athletes. And a lot mm -hmm. of these athletes are going for qualifications of world championships mm -hmm. at the Ironman <clears throat> and half Ironman distance. And, and, um, although there was back in the day, it was all about the run. Now it's really all about the swim, bike and run because athletes yep. continue to elevate and elevate and live in that high performance zone. So you got to be good at all three, yep. but there is that like surge, feel it. Can you hold it? Surge, feel it. Can you hold it? And you have to risk, you have to risk it. You have to risk if you're going for something that big, like you do have to risk it, but it's not, you know, off the couch, go out and do this long distance race and go out and, you know, blow the gates off. Cause you'll blow up. 
like yeah. you said, like there's, there is that razor's edge. So we have a, a motto that we live by around here, which is a little bit every day over a long period of time. Nice. Um, yeah. And that's how change occurs. That's how our consistency happens, that base. And consistency is something that we talk about a lot. And I've, I've heard you talk about it as well. Can you speak to the importance of consistency as far as like, as we're looking to elevate ourselves or make change in our life, uh, pull ourselves out of that negativity and into the positivity? Yeah, well, I love it. I was just actually, I've got a podcast called The High Performance Zone. It's funny you mentioned those words, right? That's uh, that's the podcast that, that I do. And I just got off one prior to this. And we were talking about the base of that performance uh, triangle is, is a consistent routine, right? And so I'm with you 100%. And when you add that consistency in with also just getting a little bit better each time. So I'll give you an example in my world. So, you know, the Blue Angels, we start flying. Most fighter pilots, well, heck, most civilian pilots never even get to fly formation, okay? That's just not done. I mean, two civilian airplanes, you got to have five miles of uh, separation uh, or a thousand feet vertical because, you know, the, the intent is, hey, stay away from somebody. Well, in the military, it's just the opposite. You're going to have a wingman. You're going to go in uh, to combat. And, and you know, usually it's pretty widespread, to be honest with you. But pilots, we like to look good. So when we come over the carrier, uh, you tuck it in. Well, you tuck it in and you saw it in the movie, you know, to about really 10 feet, which at, you know, a 22 ton jet going 600 miles per hour, that, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, and you hold it straight and level. And then when I showed up on the Blue Angels, they said, no, 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 that's not good enough. See, Gucci, we fly at 36 inches. And we do aerobatics low to the ground. That said that I need a 300% improvement over my best performance. And they said, you got three months to do it in. So can you imagine that? Let's take any athlete, okay? You, you, got, you, you want a 300% improvement over the best you've ever done. And you're going to, you need to do this in three months. That's what they basically were. By the way, they didn't say that to me. They showed me, they strapped me in the back seat of an F-18 and my first flight, I'll never forget. My eyes got so big because we launch off the runway, four jets. Pilot does this violent left wing down. We go slicing underneath the wing, wing tip of number two jet. Next thing I know, we're tucked in underneath the afterburners of the number one jet. And, they, and then all four go straight up. The flames are there. The airplane's shaking. There's metal all around around me. I've never been in this kind of environment. Uh, and then we go into a vertical loop. And I mean, my eyes got really big. I was like, holy crap. You know, I'd flown in Top Gun. I had done all that other stuff. And this is a whole new level we're talking about. And what's interesting when people, when you take it to a whole new level, it's not about talking about it. It's about doing it, right? I mean, someone shows you and, uh, and uh, you know, and once you see it, you go, whoa, okay, this is possible. Somebody's done it. All right. Now, how do I do it? And that's a whole different training method. I mean, for 90 days, 120 training flights, but it's very much an incremental improvement where we eventually get down to 18 inches. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's mind blowing. It's fun though. <laughs> <laughs> we were out uh, riding yesterday our bikes. I'm sure you're familiar with Torrey Pines here mm -hmm. in San Diego, the golf course, but also there's a, a wonder, a great hill. It's about a mile and a half up to the golf course where we go, we do repeats. So we ride the bike yeah. up, we were come down, we were the bike I like that you call it a great hill because I call them pain ass hills. <laughs> but, uh, but I like your attitude right there. That told me something about you. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, anything around, we just came off a cycling challenge in Costa Rica. So anything, Wow. to a six to eight percent pitch is Costa Rican flat. So Torrey <laughs> Pines Hill is Costa Rica flat. So it's mindset, right? Like yeah. it felt so much mm -hmm. harder before I went to Costa Rica. But now on the other side of that, I'm like, yeah, it's nothing. Nice. But anyway, the um the guys, which I'm assuming were coming out of Miramar, um, they were out they, yeah, they were out there yesterday. We and couldn't see him at first through the cloud cover. Yeah. We could hear him, but we couldn't see him. But you can you could feel it. Yeah. Right. Like you could feel it and it's so loud and you can't even see them because we're in June gloom. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but after we got off the bike and we were like, Oh, here they come again. Of course, we're all pumped up because we're talking, to, we're talking to you today. And, um, and we could see them cutting through the clouds, but that experience of, I can't even imagine being that close to an airplane flames. And I mean, it's, it's reminding me of the story of like when they broke the sound barrier, yeah. right? Like the whole thing was shaking it shakes yeah. and it's on that razor's edge. Um, but it's not, 
It's not going from zero to razor's edge. No. no like you I, said, it's that incremental. Yeah. I mean, we would, we would, well, first off, um, what we did wasn't dangerous, but it's inherently unforgiving. All right. So it's because we had a process and a mindset. You hit two of the, the keys. First off, you need the mindset first, and then you need a process. You need a training plan, you need a schedule and, and those kinds of things. Um, so we would incrementally increase it. You would go from a single airplane to two airplanes. You're flying 10 feet to six feet to four feet to three feet to 18 inches. Then we're adding a third airplane, then a fourth. You just don't dive into this. And it's very much an incremental. Think about your training before, you know, you actually do an event, right? It's an incremental process. Uh, and, and then the key though is the recovery. And I'm thinking about, you know, how you guys uh, on a triathlete, the recovery process between the training evolution. So we would call them a flight. What's critical is I call a cadence of execution. So, you know, we talked about consistency, but I would actually call it a cadence of execution where first off is my mental and physical preparation. So that's getting ready before the event. So we would have a briefing. I would be visualizing. I use mental as well as physical assets. Hopefully I'm eating well. I'm doing all the things I can do to be uh, in the right state to give me the best chance for that day. Then I brief it and I visualize it. Um, and and I, when I visualize, it's not just thinking about it. I, I'm feeling it. I, I I know exactly what it looks like. What are the letters on the airplane that I'm next to? Um, so I'm, I'm living it, right? I'm breathing it. And it's one thing to visualize yourself. It's really cool in the Blue Angels when we do a group visualization. That That's unbelievable mm -hmm. when you have that power in a group, right? Then you execute the event and you do it. But the most important part is what I would call the debrief, okay? Now, the concept of debrief is not new, but in the Blue Angels, we took it to a whole new level. And that's where the learnings come in. So we put more emphasis on the post-event than we did the pre-event. And if you think about everybody here who's listening, I guarantee you, look at the amount of effort that you put into before a race. Look at all the preparation, look at all the effort, and yet how much effort do you put in after the race? To do two things. One is celebrate what the hell you just did because you better celebrate your victories so you want to get out there and do it again. But more importantly, learn from it. Where were the gaps? Where can I improve my own performance? Where can we as a team improve? Where can I improve um, the elements of not just the execution but what happened prior to? That's the secret sauce. The secret sauce of the Blue Angels is the way we debrief and the way we keep gratitude as the the ethos of what we're doing. Mm. Well, I think that's the essence uh, to bring it back to triathlon too. How, how you analyze or debrief after the race is the nugget of information that's going to keep you in the sport longer, uh, more consistent, more successful. But the mind is such a, I find it's, it's such an unreliable <laughs> The memory is very unreliable. So if you don't write it down, you don't do this immediately quickly have my athletes write race reports uh, a lot so that they can actually understand what they took in for nutrition, how they felt on the run so that they can apply it to the future races versus some athletes that just, and, and I don't know if this happens in flying too, they just move on to the next thing. And they're, right. they're kind of like circling around the same opportunities. And, and you can see from the outside perspective, back to that 10,000 foot view, you see, oh my God, this could if we went down this path and actually corrected some of these things, mm -hmm. what more could we get out of it? No, I love what you said. It, it, so we on the blues, and I think this is true for, you know, the athletes that are listening to this is we have systematized the debrief. Okay. And you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You want to take some notes. Um, you also, the, the sooner you do it, the better because our minds are fleeting, right? So we debrief right after the event. It's not like, oh, go take a shower, relax. No. I mean, I get out of that airplane. Uh, first thing we do is we shake each other's hands because, you know, you're alive. It's kind of cool <laughs> to, to be alive. And you guys say, yeah, thanks. That was fun. Let's go do that again tomorrow. Um, the other thing we do is we debrief our maintenance crew right away because they've got to take care of the jet. You know, I always told my maintenance team, Team that um, they own the jet. I just borrowed it one hour a day, 23 other hours of the day. They own it, right? And so, you know, I need them working on what's important right away, right? And mm -hmm. they need that feedback. So um, first, uh, I'm trying to help another person, not myself. I'm trying to help my team, right? Um, 
And that's really critical too. That's a life skill. If, if you really go at it where you want to help someone else, you watch how your performance will improve. Um, it, it's, it's a big flip because we always think, oh, you know, well, if I, I got to get better, I got to get better. Heck, I want my competitor to get better. I want to help them as best I can because that's going to plant the seed in my mind that shit, you better get your act together, you know? And, uh, and so anyhow, it's, it's a philosophical difference that is really powerful once we buy into it. Um, but back to your comment real quick. And that is we go to the crowd line, we sign autographs for kids. That's the most important part is the look in the eye. So you get replenished with this idea of dreams and inspiration. Then we get into our debriefing room and it's planned. It's scheduled. This isn't a, Oh, by the way, let's debrief. I have it scheduled in my day. My teammates have it scheduled in. I have a photograph. I'm taking notes on my performance. Now I'm not doing it airborne, neither are you as you're performing, right? But as soon as I can, I take some quiet moments and I jot a couple of notes. Uh, and what I'm really looking for is what did I mess up? What could I have done better? Uh, if, if, it's, if it's actually out of parameters, that's called a safety. I don't want too many of those. That means I did something that, um, is out of the parameters of that of that flight, uh, but there's always room for improvement. So I'm looking for those little those little things that I can share with my team first. I don't want somebody having to point them out to me. I want to share it. So it's this idea of uh, kind of laying it on the table, uh, humility, this vulnerability, this openness and honesty, and most importantly, a self assessment and self uh, reflection that leads to your greater performance. <clears throat> I was reflecting yesterday about what, what makes me my best self. And, and what I came to, like, it wasn't, it's not the toughness. It's not my ability to push through. It's the vulnerability. Yeah. It's the truthfulness. It's the gentleness. It's the openness. And as I get to know myself better and better every day, I also get to know the ego which is not about vulnerability and gentleness and openness. So how do we get beyond that little bugger to have that truthfulness, to be able to look at ourselves, say, oh, I could have done that better without judgment, without punishing ourselves. I've heard you talk about checking your ego at the door. Yeah. How do people check their ego at the door? Well, it's mostly done with your peers. And so when I say check your ego at the door, it's because I'm about to walk into a meeting with peers. You know, and there's some seniors and there's some junior people, whatever. But it's really about being around your peers, right? And uh, and so everyone's good at what they do. Heck, you wouldn't be there. You're not, you wouldn't be getting hired. You wouldn't be on the team. So you're not trying to prove yourself. That's that's at a different stage of your evolution, right? Once you know you're really good and you've proven it, that you don't have to prove it to somebody else. Actually, I think what there is is what I call strength and vulnerability. So the vulnerability becomes a strength, not a weakness. Again, that's a mindset, right? So early on when you're being taught and all this, we're, we're what, afraid. Oh, you know, my vulnerability will show that I'm weak. My vulnerability will show that, um, you know, I'm not as good as I, as I think I am or say I am. You know, that's no, just the opposite. And, and here's the other thing. And I know you've noticed this. Go be around any world-class person. I don't care what they are. If they're world-class triathlete, they're world-class in business, if they're world-class in, in any sport. Um, and you watch, they're probably pretty humble. OK, the ones at the very, very tip of the spear are very humble. It's the ones who think they are not quite yet that typically carry around the egos. And I've been around a lot of really high performers and they're very humble. It's, it's a strength. Mm -hmm. It is a strength. Well, what did they say? The meek, the meek shall inherit Heard the earth. earth. <laughs> <laughs> not sure that's the right example. I mean, uh, I think that Jesus had a different uh, thought there, but no, yeah, I got you. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, for many years, I was not interested in humbleness or meekness or any of that stuff. But like you said, like I think as you grow, as you experience yourself, because um, you can't get away from yourself, um, that eventually maybe it's wisdom, you know, that comes with years. Maybe it is that high performance type of uh, gene that we want to keep getting better and better, but we realize that vulnerability is not a weakness. It is, in fact, uh, you know, a superpower, I believe. Absolutely. 
Let, let so, me have a point on yeah. that. Then we'll get to your next question. Um, I think there's a, we typically tend to be our own worst critics. You know, we typically are hard on ourselves, especially if you're, you know, a, you know, an athlete, you're always pushing yourself. And so I think what's critical is this balance, awareness between um, understanding. I never call it self-criticism. What I am trying to do is be self-aware. So, um, but also reinforce the positive, you know, and so I, I'm constantly also giving myself pats on the back internally, right? You know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm going, man, I feel good today. You know, hey, that looks good. I mean, I'm okay with internally uh, reinforcing the goodness. And that's why gratitude is so important because it it just puts you in a state of Oh, you know, I'm grateful I have the time to train today. I'm grateful, you know, that that the weather's nice. I'm grateful that I have a hill that will challenge me, right? There's so many things you can be grateful for. So to me, it is that that in my balance, I don't mean 50-50, but it is a it's a double-edged sword, right? And it, there's part of it where I'm always trying to get better, but I'm also celebrating the hell out of where I am. And um, yeah, it's that's important. Has that been something that, like, y- you grew up in a, you know, beautiful, loving home, it sounds, is that something that kind of, like, was hardwired into you, or was that, obviously, it's been enhanced over the years, but is it something that you really had a shift into, is this this grateful mindset, or is it something you feel like as you've always, it's always been with you? You know, as I reflect back, because I've never been asked that question, I was just thinking about my early childhood, um, I think that came from my mom. You know, she was a glass half full person, not a glass half empty. And uh, everything, um, her one statement, if it didn't go the way you wanted to, or let's say you made a mistake or you lost your bike, I mean, whatever, she would say, oh, well, you know, and and that I've taken to meet with, you know, what the heck? Oh, well, didn't go great. Let's move on. Right. Um, uh, so I, I, I did learn a lot from her uh, and just appreciating every moment, you know, like when she drank, you know, some a bottle of water, she would hold the last she'd get the last drop. It was so weird to watch as a little kid. She appreciated just the little things like the last drop of water. So I think that while that um, definitely had a big impact, you know, I think that was built into the ethos of uh, the character, but it was reinforced through the military. This is what gets really interesting. While that was part of of who I was, it was cool that when you saw in high-performance teams, whether it was playing football for Navy, whether it was for flying the jets, is um, the reinforcement came from, we're in it together, we know what our mission is, uh, we're gonna get better, and we're also going to appreciate the hell out of the opportunity, camaraderie, you know, and and so I, I think it's both, honestly. Mm-hmm. Is there a ripple effect that you've seen from that um, in the community that you've had in the, you know your your years in in this build up to who you are today? Can you see or recall moments? Because I'm assuming you were already with high performers, people who wanted to be better, but because you were setting the tone just because you believed in it, right? This is what you're passionate about. Could you see that ripple effect in the, in the, in the fighters and pilots and and schoolmates that you were? Yeah. but I like the question because even more so today, I think it's something that comes with wisdom and experience, right? So Mm. let me just, you know, to answer your question, no, I was on teams where, I mean, they were hard ass coaches and we were, you know, uh, Heck, it was all negative. It's like, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose your starting position. And um, those weren't great. Uh, at the same time, you could take that same team and just flip the mindset where you're actually helping each other. You're, you're in it for um, I love being the underdog. You know, I mean, I like playing the Ohio States of the world, Michigan. That's who I played against. And I'm a small dude. I shouldn't have been on the field. Right. But I was but it was OK. You know, I just I just earned the right. And and I like the, that idea of, hey, we're in this together and you can count on me. I'm going to count on you. We're going to trust each other. We're going to do our best job. And what changes is that I don't want to let my 
my, another person down, right? That becomes my driving force. Not that I want to score the touchdown, make the interception or, or, or win the race. Of course I want to, but the most important thing is I don't want to let anybody else down. That means I got to do my job, especially in the blue angels. I've got to fly my jet and I'm trusting that my teammates going to do the same thing. And that camaraderie, that trust, then you're absolutely right. When you have that, everything gets elevated. Your own performance elevates. The team's performance elevates. The enjoyment of the activity elevates. And absolutely, they, they thrive on each other. Mm -hmm. Along that same line of trickle effect, like planting seeds, right? So every time you give a keynote, this podcast, you're dropping seeds all over the place. You are just planting seeds everywhere. And it's not our job to water those seeds, right? It's the job of the person who receives the seeds to water them for their own life. But I'd love to hear, because I'm assuming you've got stories about seeds that were planted, that were being watered and, you know, and coming into this full bloom all the while you're living your life. And there's something over here happening that somebody's life has has taken a trajectory because of their experience through you. Well, I love the metaphor, the seeds and the watering, and then, you know, it eventually does thrive into uh, something beautiful. So, uh, yeah, two things. Uh, one is a, a story, and then I'll, I'll tell you how I'm doing it every single day consciously, intentionally, right? Um, but number one, uh, I had, I was at an event. It was uh, a big event, a corporate uh, thing. And, um, all of a sudden, someone comes up to me afterwards and they handed me their cell phone. And on the, the uh, screensaver was a picture of myself as a blue angel and, and a little boy. And, and here's what and it was. It was an old picture, right? Because I was a blue back in the early 90s. Right. And, and, and here, the gentleman looks at me and he goes, hey, Gucci, it's been a while since I've seen you. Well, this is 1990 in San Francisco. I know that because I'm number seven. And uh, and then he says this. He says, you know, I kept this picture above my bed as a kid. He was a little boy at the time, four years old. He says, I kept this picture above my desk in college. And his wife, who happened to be standing next to him, says, Gucci, you're not going to believe this. He still got that picture up in the living room. Well, it turns out that person is Blue Angel, Nate Scott. It's it's And, and it blew me away. Because I don't remember that that first experience, you know, but but back to what you were saying, the little seed that was planted in that boy's heart, um, then it took a lot of watering, took a lot of people, just like my life, um, to, to help you. But look what it, it can blossom into. So I believe that you do intention. It's good to intentionally plant seeds. We may never see the outcome and that's okay. Um, I, I think there is a technique and I'll give you this because I think it's, it's powerful for everybody. Um, how to plant seeds at night or when you wake up um, that will continue through the day. And so I plant seeds of gratitude. That's what I, what I do. I have what I call my glad to be here wake up. And I also have my glad to be here nightcap, which is basically very simply. The minute I wake up, I just say, what am I grateful for in the present moment? Here's the cool part. You can be laying in bed. You can be in the shower. You can be stretching, whatever you want to do. Uh, but it's present moment awareness. What am I grateful for? Oh, the water's warm. Hey, the, the mattress feels good. Uh, I look out. Wow, you know, the sun's coming up. This is awesome. It's just present moment awareness very quickly. Then I've learned this technique. Go back 24 hours, and this is really critical. Go back 24 hours and start to bring to mind things that you saw that, that motivated you or helped. Maybe you saw somebody help somebody else. Maybe it was a smile that somebody gave you as you were bringing their suitcase down from the overhead. Little things matter, right? Um, now you can go back as far as you want in your life. Like sometimes I keep pictures of like the day we rescued Ruby, you know, the, the, the dog, right? And she's smelling me and my wife's there and it's a beautiful picture, right? And I just, it just brings back good memories, right? But then here's the other key, go forward in your day. And think about others, not just yourself. I go outside right away. Very first thing I do, I open up my arms, open my chest, and I just say, may I be available to somebody. Like today, this podcast. I have no idea who's hearing this, right? But the idea is, may you just be available. Well, that to me, you're not only planting seeds, but here's the cool part. When you go to bed, you want to do the same technique. And, and what you actually are doing is you're actually starting to water the seeds by rejoicing. Rejoice in the little good things you've done that day. Rejoice. And then as you're sleeping, you watch. 
the brain is a cool thing. Uh, what you go to bed with thinking is going to materialize. So if you go to bed worried and stressed out and all pissed off, you're just creating that. So that's my technique. I actually have a, a gratitude pack. Uh, people can go to my website if they want, johnfoleyinc.com. Um, we just put it out. It's actually not on the open market yet. But anyhow, just if you want, um, you can sign up for our, our list or whatever to stay connected. But I, I put this in a course, a very simple course on gratitude. And probably the most important one is how do you reboot yourself when something pisses you off? When something, you know, it knocks you off balance. You watch four steps happens every time. First thing you do is you get knocked off balance. It could be an email. It could be somebody said something. And then all of a sudden you start thinking about it. And as you're ruminating on it, you start to get mad, you know, then you start to get really upset. Now you get angry. Next thing you are, you're resentful and watch how quickly that cycle can take. So what we have to do is we got to stop that and, and then reboot with gratitude. So lots of techniques, but, um, that's the most important one, just how you go to bed and how you wake up. Yeah. There's some science around that too. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, that, you know, things that ruminate, that we ruminate when we're sleeping mm -hmm. so many times back in the day before I really knew how to train my mind, you know, I'd be going to bed, um, uh, you know, looking at the bank account and just feeling really panicked mm -hmm. and, and right. going to sleep now in this lack mindset. Right. And so like you, I do a morning uh, routine. It's just so natural and an evening one. And I, I thank for the day and, and for everything, the challenges and the connection and the nourishment and the moments of effort, and the moments of ease. And then I just kind of give it all back, you know, and just get clear for the next day. Um, Beautiful. I so, would suggest just call that you're glad to be here put a name to it. Okay. And you can come up with your own name. I don't care. But for me, it's glad to be here now. Now I know why I'm doing that. Right. Uh, it's yeah. reinforcing the goodness and you're absolutely right. The science backs it up tremendously. Yeah. Do you have, um, any stillness practices? Do you oh, have a meditation practice? What oh, yeah. does that look like? Yeah. Focus. Yeah. Well, I have a, a morning meditation. I've studied meditation deeply in, in India. Uh, I've been at the feet of the Dalai Lama multiple times. Uh, I I've studied some deep techniques. Um, but I've really come down to what works for me is a very simple, uh, visualization process. I've actually combined, uh, uh, it's more like a problem solving meditation, uh, visualization with, uh, a, a sitting stillness practice. So, uh, I like to do it every morning. I don't, I don't go crazy. 11 minutes is usually what I do. I bring in some breathing practices in that also, but it's more about blocking out the external, bringing in a, a focused awareness. And then once I get focused, I have to have some intention of what am I going to do with that focus? So it's not just calming your mind. It's okay. Now I'm in a calm state. How can I direct that energy to serve others? How can I direct that energy in a way that, um, you know, I like to call myself an angel of appearances. May I appear as someone needs me. I don't care how I look to somebody else unless it's helpful to them, right? That's that's the key, right? Uh, I, I like to be giving. So, you know, how can I give of my time, my energy, resources? My wife and I started the Glad to Be Our Foundation, and we donate 10% of all our fees to charity. And because of that, we sponsored over 300 nonprofits around the world, changing blindness. So we actually, we have, we uh, sponsor 47 kids in 47 countries. This idea of, of oneness, right? So yes, I have a, a an absolute focus practice. But what I've learned is it's more, even more important than that is movement. So I've incorporated a morning movement routine. It involves kind of a Navy SEAL routine with yoga. And I stand on my head every day. Um, but I, I have both a, a stillness and a movement practice at the same time. Mm. That's what I do. No, yeah, well, it's not. I feel like it's not rigid and it's okay yeah. not to be rigid. It's okay to feel into these things. It's not like you're doing it wrong or you're doing it right. You're doing what is working for you. Yeah. Like I just went to a Qigong class this morning. I love it. You know, movement, flow. Um, but yes, I, I do have that routine every morning. It starts with mental. So gratitude and in, inward practice, uh, a movement practice. Uh, and then also, um, you know, spiritual. I mean, I pray for people. I, I, I want to have everything to be a beautiful life. Mm, that's be. I love that. And and it is. It is a oneness. You know. And we are. I do believe we're we're here to serve. Um, 
So as we begin to wrap this up, because I know you have an appointment. That's, know, that's okay. Did you hear that wine? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was Nash. He's been with me all afternoon and he's saying, dad, we got to go for a walk. So yeah, he says, I don't want to just be a foster. I want to live here. Yeah, he does. I'm glad think, to be here. I, I think we're going to be a foster fail. I think we're going to end up keeping Yeah. You should shoot for that. Um, so as we begin to wrap this up, because I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have an appointment. Um, trust. Trust. Someone says, ah, oh, but Gucci, you don't understand. Everyone in my life has failed me. You know, it's it's not, I, I you know, I can't, I've got this dream, but I have no idea how to get there. And this idea of trust, how do people begin to to build trust? Yeah, for me, it's very simple. It, it, it's trust and change, I think, start on the inside and then work their way out. So um, first thing I want to do is just start to build trust of myself, right? Um, trust in yourself, trust in, you know, what's around you, uh, trust in your potential. I mean, even if things are going bad, it's okay. You know, you can change that. Right. Um, and I, I like, you know, it's back to Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. So if you want other people to trust you, you've got to be trustworthy. Right. So the other thing I would add to that is just small things matter. You know, we think trust, Oh, it's a big thing. Can I fly 18 inches from another jet at 500 miles per hour? Well, it, it also starts with just showing up on time, showing up in a state of positivity, um, you know, making a cup of tea for somebody, um, just being present, being aware. So it's small things matter uh, in respect and small things matter in trust. So I'd work on small things and then you watch. Um, it'll change, you know. The I, yeah, that's so epic. Uh, show up on time. You know, we always say our, our audience and our athletes probably we're ad nauseum. Let your yes be yes. Yeah. Let your no be no. Um, and and that actually will help build self-trust because it feels like this really big esoteric thing. But it's like, no, you say you're going to be there at seven, be there at seven. And and you you start to begin to trust yourself with that. Um I would also any, any add real quick because I think it's important because I do bust that. I mean, I'm supposed to be a military guy, all discipline and all this. Let me tell you, I'm terrible at it with my wife. And that's a problem because she knows it and she points it out to me. And, and I realized that, um, you know, I, I got to choose to make that difference. Right. So if I don't, I say, OK, I'll fix it. And I just tell myself I busted that, but I'll fix it and um, and then fix it <laughs> you know, then take the action. Right. Right. Any um any final thoughts you want to leave our audience with as you as you've just you know shared so much insight and inspiration and they're going to take it into action we hope but uh, any any final thoughts you want to share? Well, I think you know if I'm listening to this and I'm a triathlete and I'm working my butt off and you know I know about nutrition I know about practice and all the things that everyone who's listening to this does, I'm sure extremely well, right? I would stick with the joyful effort. Stick with the glad to be here. You're working hard. You're, you're, you're good. Enjoy it, right? Enjoy the moment of that. Um, that's why I add the word effort to joyful because it means, hey, I got to get up in the morning. I, I need to do, you know, certain, I, I get to do certain things. So um, yeah, live a joyful life that's based on glad to be here. And the last thing I'd say is it is so simple. You got to give before you receive. So I, I kind of mentioned that earlier, but, you know, um, give your knowledge, help an, another athlete, help someone like this podcast. You all are helping lots of people um, give first and then you'll see the, the seeds will ripen. I think Jess, you said that and uh, enjoy life. Glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And it's against the green. It's against the green to give first and then receive. Mm -hmm. So we always say live against the grain, like be the one tenth of one tenth of one percent, please. My gosh, we need more people <laughs> scrunched into that one percent uh, because it's so darn good there. Well, thank you so much, uh, John. It's w worth the wait. Uh, wonderful to meet you and share this time with you today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Glad to be here. Gucci out.